further remarks. I think Anne, you had a short introduction. Oh, yeah, uh, it was just to present uh, Chris and the hill, but I think Chris maybe it will be better that you present what? a bit yourself. Sure, sure. I, I can be self presenting. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Uh, uh, so just to say that it's a delight to be to be with you all, and uh, thank you very much for asking me to come along. And um, and as has been uh, quite clear from the presentation from Dorica, uh, this is all about the quality of life in one particular area. Uh, so this is the um, this, this is the presentation that I want to give you over the next uh, fifteen minutes or so, twenty minutes. So the um, organization I want to speak about is called Thrive, and I am the founder of Thrive. I started it in 1978, would you believe? And so um, uh, I am an old social entrepreneur who has uh, begun a number of organizations, and Thrive was my first one. And as you will see, Thrive is all about gardening and disabled people. And uh, so the importance of gardening for disabled people, being in touch with nature, being productive, helping to create a special safe environment and the importance of gardening in being still, in other words, a kind of meditation. So as I said to you, in, uh, I started uh, Thrive in 1978. I had this vision that uh, disabled people and uh, of all kinds, both uh, people with a mental disability and the people with physical disability and so on, they had a right to be able to garden, to get access to gardens and to be able to do something in the garden. And uh, my first customers, my first clientele were in the old long stay hospitals because in that time, uh, we still had quite a number of long stay hospitals for the mentally ill in Britain. And so uh, we began to work with uh, people in long stay hospitals and actually one of the first client, professional client groups were occupational therapists who first started to work with us to give a kind of a sense of therapy and so on. Time has gone on now. And of course, uh, it, uh, the situation is very different. Uh, and there are many professionals now working with us in the field of uh, horticulture and therapy in the field of gardening and disabled people. But that was how it started. And um, as I go through this presentation, I, I want to give you some photographs as well, because I think a picture speaks like a thousand words, you know? And so here we have one of the young people at uh, Thrive, at the headquarters of Thrive, actually working on potting up one of the main, most important practical uh, features of gardening, which is to be able to take a small seedling and to pot it on into a larger pot and then therefore allow, allow it to grow further. So this is a genuine mix of horticulture and knowledge of horticulture and gardening on the one hand, and of course, the interests of the disabled person on the other hand, and in particular, the disabled child or young person when it comes to your interests. So the importance of gardening for disabled people, there are a number of things which one can say about this. And if we had longer, I would probably take longer. But the fact of the matter is that uh, we could probably uh, bring it down to three different really important points. The first point is socialization. Uh, when a person goes gardening, or when a person is involved in gardening, particularly in the, in the context of a project or a team, uh, socialization becomes almost a natural part of the process. And, uh, and that is something which I think is really important. Socialization, being able to just make friends at your own speed, as you do something in the garden uh, is really important. If you feel suddenly feel shy or don't feel like doing something or don't feel like talking, I should say, then you can always just get on with the work uh, and the work is necessary to make the garden beautiful. So this brings about a massive amount of satisfaction. And, and the point is that it's not in quotation marks, manufactured satisfaction. This is real satisfaction that you get from being in a team and it's real satisfaction that you get from actually being able to grow something. And then finally, but not least, you get all the, uh, the benefits of integration into larger life, into a larger sense of society and so on. Uh, in the UK, 
and I'm sure it's the true, true in many countries, but in the UK, gardening is one of the uh, three top hobbies in the country, the top pastimes in the country. And so what happens is that you are being integrated naturally and at the, at the pace that you can go into a national hobby. And that really is important. So here you get all of those qualities of socialization, of satisfaction, and of integration with, uh, with this particular team working in the, uh, in the headquarters of Thrive. Um, and, uh, and you get an enormous amount of involvement, whether people are coming as volunteers, whether they're coming as people who are actually benefiting from a program, or whether they are uh, people who are just visiting for the day. And what has happened at Thrive is that we have started, as it were, in one particular place. And then we have gone on and started to have horticultural programs in many different gardens, public gardens, in many different places around the country. <laughs> I cannot emphasize enough how important it has become uh, being in touch with nature for people. And of course, uh, when you think about it as a member of the audience now, when you think about it, being in touch with nature is just as important for you as an individual as it might be for anybody else. So, so uh, being in touch with nature is, is, is a number of things all coming together. So how a plant works, how planting works, how an individual plant works. Uh, I'm not talking so much about the scientific aspects of it, although that can be really interesting for some people. But it is important to understand that if you take a bulb, for example, from a rhizome and plant it, and then you stand back, you put, you pat the earth around it, how the earth works, you put the earth around it. And then one week or two weeks later, you start to see the first shoots. And this is like, it's almost like magic at first. Um, it's almost as if you can't believe that this is happening. And yet nature is working with you, the gardener, or with you, the occupational therapist, or with you, the parent, uh, to be able to uh, make this happen for you. And so what happens, which I think is so interesting, is that you get this very prosaic, very natural, very functional feeling going on. Earth can be dirty on your hands. And of course, as part of the socialization process, you go and wash your hands and all of that sort of thing. But of course, at another, at another level, as you start to see the new shoots growing, you then get a spiritual experience effectively. You realize that there is something larger than yourself that is actually happening here and that you have been able to be a part of it. You are an instrument in it. And that, of course, can be really satisfying. And, uh, and many people have spoken to the benefits of this. So being in touch with nature is a really important feature of horticulture as therapy, as gardening as therapy. And it can be done at all different kinds of scale. It can be uh, uh, in a situation where you can be highly productive. Um, and, uh, and I think that's important. I wanted to tell you about Robert in the early days of Thrive. This is 1978, 1979, about 1980, around there. Um, Robert uh, was a, a young lad um, with uh, Down syndrome, and he was uh, in one of these long stay hospitals his parents had put him there. And um, uh, his parents were invited one day to come and see the horticultural project, and they came. And Robert invited me, and he invited his parents to come and visit him and to see him. And so we went into the ward where the beds were. And the ward was, you know, pretty, pretty austere, pretty utilitarian. It wasn't a very, it was a clean place, but it wasn't, it was rather drab. And we all sat on the bed, the two parents and myself, we sat on the bed. And Robert reached into the cupboard, which was by his bed. And he produced a big cabbage like this, a huge cabbage. And he said, mom and dad, I have grown this cabbage and it's for you. And so he handed it over. And uh, I am, of course, I'm a very sentimental person. So I was crying away like mad. Um, and uh, they were crying and everybody was crying basically. And it was a very joyous occasion, a very happy occasion. 
And we had so many stories of this kind, of people being able to reach across these natural divides and being able to give gifts to each other of, of growing products, flowers, uh, plants, vegetables, and so on and so forth. And, and at some point, Robert actually went on and started to work in the horticultural industry. And so from his point of view, it was an incredible opportunity. And we found that that happened from time to time. It's important when you uh, set out a project of this nature, it's important to think about the safety, the personal safety of individuals working in the, pro in the program. It's very important to think about the cooperation of, of various bodies that might want to come together to help this project become really effective. So local authorities and the parks and gardens, for example, church communities, uh, small NGOs, all sorts of people uh, representing the community in one way and another have uh, you know, a, a responsibility to help create a special safe environment. And also I think it's important to remember the natural aspects of working with mud, working with earth, working with nature which is that, of course, you learn how to look after yourself, you learn how to wash your hands and keep clean, you will learn how to keep your tools clean. And so there's many natural things about it as well. Being involved with nature uh, is in itself a kind of meditation. When you get used to the work, for example, weeding, and you get used to being able to weed, uh, or, for example, digging and so on, you get into a rhythm, and that rhythm is in itself a kind of meditation. And it brings about, of course, integration being social, as we noticed earlier in the presentation, teamwork, and nature itself. Just to finish, I just wanted to give you a sense of how important this particular kind of program can be. Um, here we have one of the uh, relatives of Her Majesty the Queen, this is Princess Alexandra, who is now uh, a, a patron of Thrive. And uh, she came, as I came, to the 40th anniversary of the organization uh, a year or two ago now. And uh, we were very privileged to be there. She was very generous and, and uh, gave a lot of her time. And she made a lot of very sweet remarks, which were very nice to hear. And here she gave a number of different awards to people who had worked hard during the previous year to make the project a success. And so people were given these various different recognitions. And uh, this was one of them. So in finishing, uh, Anne, just to say, if, there's, if you have questions right now, of course I will answer them. But if you wanted to write to me, then there's my email address. You're most welcome to write to me, anybody on the um, audience. This is the, uh, this is the um, website for Thrive. And here's an interview that I carried out. And what I'll do, Anne, is share this. I'll make sure that you get this presentation so that you can make it available to, um, to uh, friends and colleagues in this audience if they would like to see it. So I'll stop sharing, but I doesn't mean to say I'm going to stop being here. And I'll, um, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. I just want to say thank you very much, Chris, for being here today with us, because I think it, it was uh, um, the sort of presentation that uh, we would like to listen uh, when we speak about quality of life for people with rare diseases. I think it's very proper uh, to, to listen because, uh, as we said before, life is more than the diagnose. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we have to, to teach our uh, beneficiaries how to enjoy the life and be active and uh, 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 be proud about what they do. I know yeah. this from our center is the same feeling as you said about Robert. So yes. it's very important. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Doric. I think that's right. And I think it's important to, 
to understand that some quality of life programs, of which this is an example, uh, make it easier for the individual to transition into, uh, into the community or into a larger set of friends or into a larger part of society. And it's a, it, and a common interest is, of course, the feature here. A common interest is really a, a fantastic way of, be, of becoming more integrated. Chris, can I ask you a question? Yes. Uh, I mean, first of all, it was really very interesting. I think it's this sort of initiatives which can really have a major impact on the quality of life of our patients. Just a very materialistic question, maybe a bit yeah. cynical, but <laughs> did you, was this your job? Did you manage to make a living out of it, uh, to live out of it and, and to dedicate all your uh, energies to this? Or did you have a job and you did this in, in in brackets in your spare time, I think. Sure, no, I get that. So for the first seven years, that is to say 1978, 1979, 80, et cetera. For the first seven years, I ran this as a full-time project. Um, and so I was making a living from it myself as the founder. Um, uh, uh, but we were getting in uh, much more money than, than I needed to be paid. Um, and so uh, we were also developing uh, the headquarters of the organization and so on and so forth. So this required a certain amount of investment. But, um, but what has happened since then is that many, of, uh, many different centers around the country have come together. Many of them have been volunteer led. Uh, and so what was important under those circumstances is that uh, land or land plus a small building or land plus a glass house and small building uh, are provided and that's where the local authority has often come in um, and so there are different there are different business models for this uh, and so if you know if um, if uh, a particular group in Ithaca wanted to set up such a project I'd be happy to talk through which would be the most useful business model so it, it doesn't always have to be that you have to be paid for it I was in that particular case because I was I was in those early days, I was proposing this uh, from scratch. In other words, it was something quite new at that time, not totally new, but quite new. Um, so I was proposing it from scratch. But now that the idea is well understood and now that the idea is well resourced in the sense that we from Thrive can provide information and materials and so on and so forth, which incidentally I'm sure would be available to individuals in this particular uh, call, then of course it's, um, it, you can often get a situation where the, the workforce is volunteer or mostly volunteer and where maybe one person is paid, but maybe they're paid by the local authority. They don't have to necessarily, or by a local charity or by the church or whatever it is. So you don't need huge amounts of money to start it. But it was a useful question. Thank you for that. Thank you very much. Very clear, very clear answer. Thanks. Great, I can. I I feel that I may have, I may be about to overstay my welcome, so I need to be moving on. I think. Um, so Anne, I'll make sure that you get that presentation so that you can. Yes, make it please. Available. Thank you, and welcome back to you shortly. It was very interesting. Thank you very much, Chris. It's a great pleasure. I'll leave you all now, but and have a good continuation. <laughs>